What is consciousness? Wow. Oh, yes. That, oh, I had this mystical experience. <clears throat> One night I was kneeling down fervently praying to God, and all of a sudden I had this epiphany. I realized I was talking to myself, which made me God. I was praying to God. <laughs> the brain is just a hunk of meat. But it's a hunk of meat that its byproduct is consciousness. St. Paul said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now that's pretty airy fairy. But I agree, we see things through the glasses which are our experience. I think consciousness is the ability to respond to your environment and awareness that one is responding. All humans have a wish to have something continue beyond our death. I think this wish is that we survive our own death is so strong that there is a strong tendency to create belief systems that that will happen. It's central. Mm -hmm to human thinking, yeah. but whether it's central to human thinking, whether that makes it true or not. Thank all of you for being here. This is something we're putting together. Dr. Bohr is a friend of mine, and uh, we've done some things on radio, things for our class, Psychology and Religion. I'm Jim Skaliski. I teach at Citrus College and Psychology and Religion, some other classes. But today we're going to focus on the idea of consciousness. I have uh, some friends, Greg, uh, Rick, Dr. Brown here, and Lou, Lou Ornelas, and of course Vernon Brown. But you described yourself as a materialist. Now, uh, I'm going to, hope <clears throat> to give us a definition so my students and those uh, looking at us can uh, have an understanding of what you mean by that. Uh, that's a heavy. Uh, it means that I believe in the material world and things beyond that, they, I feel many of it is airy fairy. Uh, the soul, if I talk about something on the bottom of my shoe, I can understand that. I can touch it. I can see, feel it. I can smell it if I want. Um, but when you talk about the concept of something that does not have any material form and supposedly exists beyond our death, um, I have problems with that. No, I think there is consciousness. I think that, <clears throat> I think the, um, I think it arises, however, from, from something material. Uh, the brain is just a hunk of meat. But it's a hunk of meat that, its byproduct is consciousness. Um, it's sort of like, let's analogize to, the liver. Bile is a product of liver. Liver is a functioning organ, uh, but the bile is not. It's the end product. Mm -hmm. And of course we're tackling something that scholars from time immemorial have struggled with. No, I'm saying that you can describe an organ as generating something like say bile or, or tears or and you can experience objectively mm -hmm. the product of that organ. Is something material producing something it's material. Okay. Whereas the brain is something material and I'm postulating 
that is producing something called consciousness, right. which you can't measure, right. can't touch. Um, and meaningless I, illusions well, you, you, at you time also. You certainly like cannot uh, uh, make an objective observation of it. Okay. So you no. can only experience it. Consciousness is only known through the experience of it. I always kind of drag you into these existential questions because your life <laughs> in philosophy is more... Uh, uh, you want to give us your philosophy? It's usually a, a joyful well, one. <laughs> yes, part of my philosophy is while you live, Let's live in clover for when you're dead, you're dead all over. <laughs> I, <laughs> so live in it I, now fully. I, 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 don't, I have great difficulty believing that something we call consciousness yeah. lasts beyond the machine that the machine that produces the brain. Uh, there's the, the question of consciousness surviving death, and there's also the, con the question of consciousness as a mystery in its own right. Even if you don't believe that consciousness survived death, it still needs to be explained in this life. So they, Would it make a because, difference in how you lived your life, do you think? I mean, I if think you so. knew there was a life after, or if there's no life after, would that so. make any difference in how you lived your life? I think it would make a tremendous difference. In what way? Well, I think that if you didn't believe in, in life after death, uh, and I'm not saying that I do, I, I'm on the fence, uh, but um, if, you, if you do, it gives you hope, obviously, in your current life. Um, and, and you have something, uh, you sort of have something to look forward to, you, you have uh, a way of maybe justifying pain and, and suffering. Well, if you don't believe in it, then you can have to make, I think you would have to live your philosophy, live by the philosophy of uh, make the, the best of it. As well, well so, you know, for a thousand years, the Jewish tradition really had no, no notion of an afterlife, really. I recently wrote a little essay on, on the God of the Old Testament, you know, talking about the yin and the yang, mm -hmm. he was not a very nice guy. Mm -hmm. In fact, killed a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the dark side. I think in Christianity, the dark side are things like the religious wars, the, uh, certainly the Inquisition, killing people that don't believe the way you do. Um, I think that However, as far as my, one other comment that maybe I didn't finish, St. Paul talked about um, faith. And I think when you deal with belief systems about consciousness, St. Paul said faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now that's pretty airy fairy, mm -hmm. and uh, but I think that even in science, which I dabbled in for a while, you have to have faith. Faith, you know, that your measuring systems are okay and working, yeah. and that your paradigm uh, really is covering what you're examining. Vern, would you say then that science does have its limits? Yeah, I think so. Well, we have to realize that everything is perceptual. We perceive the world in a certain way, and then we draw conclusions based upon the perception, not necessarily based upon the way the world really is. Can, can the spiritual world and the world of science come together and create a new paradigm for the future? Is that possible? When we talk, again, going back to the mystics, who claim to have this experience that surpasses our ordinary awareness, you know, where do we put our credence in terms of, of what's real. But even this idea of living by what's good or bad depends upon our belief system. Uh, yeah. Descartes' meaning, I think, therefore, I am, is that I have an experience and therefore it's essentially an argument for consciousness. We would say that, that a living thing has some reflexive intelligence to some degree because an animal, may have, I mean, a, an amoeba may have reflexive intelligence but we bring it to a certain mm -hmm. level, and where is it then a person who may have a lower IQ, they have a consciousness and they're aware, mm -hmm. and they're maybe experiencing, they're, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. maybe not cognitively mm -hmm. fully developed. Someone or, in a coma, but you, they have reflexes. Mm -hmm. You know, you can run a key across the bottom of their foot, they will move, and uh, you know, that is a question. They certainly are reactive.
do they think? I, I, I don't know. Well, this is one that people have tack <clears throat> tackled through the centuries, and I'm not certain I'm smart enough to unravel it, but what is... Yeah, I would say consciousness is awareness of our environment and interactive, being interactive with our environment. Um, the ability to be interactive with it, our environment. The problem with that definition though is that you would have to be a lot inclusive and you would have to include certain plants. So we could ask questions such as, is a slug conscious or is an amoeba conscious in this kind of things? Do we have, do they have a minimum of consciousness that we could talk about? Or mm. is there a defining line, a defining limit or boundary that mm -hmm. you must cross in order to sound? When you say an amoeba reacts, it definitely reacts. Is there any awareness within the amoeba That's that is reacting. doing that? I think consciousness is the ability to respond to your environment and awareness that one is responding. The question is, are we aware of everybody else's consciousness or are we aware of our own consciousness to the point where we, we see some, something and okay, if I see you and you talk to me, then there's gotta be, you gotta have a conscience. So yeah. how can you measure conscious unless you're measuring your own conscience. That's the only one you can you know, measure. You can really. only measure your own well, conscience. Well, that's the only one you can be aware. And that's what Descartes was saying, uh, in a way. I think, therefore, I am. I wish sure the fact that I have an experience, I know I'm conscious. But I do not know that you are. I can only exactly. assume that you are. It starts with an awareness. And when, when awareness gets to a certain point, it becomes conscious. Mm -hmm. okay. Animals are aware. Okay. When they start being able to move things, they're conscious mm -hmm. a little bit. We have far more consciousness than animals. And so I'm wondering this idea that Ken Wilber loves so much is including and transcending. So that it seems like the human consciousness has the ability to include our animal nature, so to speak, and then transcend it in some sense, whether it's technology or uh, even thought processes. And I'm wondering if that comes into play somehow, that we, and consciousness, we include and there's a movement toward transcending, or maybe you would even call it mental evolution. Or the brain is really not designed to really answer the kind of questions that we're asking around, uh, here, or the big questions. The brain is not designed to really go beyond its limits, which is essentially basic survival. In the sense um, of well-being, uh, to have a knowledge, to know. You know, Thomas Aquinas said there are three pleasures in life. He said, can you guess them? He said one was... Sex. 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 Yeah, Very good. He uses the yeah. sex last time. <laughs> well, the other is to, um, to, to enjoy food, the pleasure of food. And the third is learning. So you Something didn't, you didn't spiritual. Get too, you didn't get too excited about that. But, but, but of the three, I mean, uh, uh, of, you look at the first two, that the sex is pleasurable and you really can't go back to it. The food is pleasurable, you can't go back to it. But learning is very sweet, and you can go back to it. You can include and transcend, and there's a sweetness, there's a well-being. So not only is it to survive, but it's to survive with a sense of wellness. Yes. But I would argue that learning has a definite evolutionary advantage. So the reason why we enjoy learning is because it has an evolutionary advantage. It's just that now we're indulging in it because we're deriving the pleasure out of it. There's reward in learning. And there's, there's the reason why there's reward in learning is because in the past yes. it allows us to survive. I together. think in a broader sense, if you look at um, animal behavior, mm -hmm. there seems to be altruistic behavior yeah. toward yeah. the group. Towards and group. hostility to toward the yeah. yes, yes. out group, it, and I think without that, I, I don't think that certainly humans would not have survived without some altruism. I think that yeah. one uh, psychologist defined IQ as the ability to survive, and I think that's pretty good. That when you think about it, maybe that's the bottom line, whether it's a plant or an animal or mm -hmm. humans. And even in the theology, the idea is we're going to su survive beyond this. So maybe central um, is this idea of surviving. I think that all humans have a wish to have something continue beyond our death. I think this wish is that we survive our own death is so strong 
that there is a strong tendency to create belief systems that that will happen. It's central mm -hmm. to human right. thinking, yeah. but whether it's central to human thinking, whether that makes it true or not, is a different question. Is a totally okay. different question. I have no desire to think of a heaven or a hell or anything beyond that. And that makes me very happy. You're going to go to hell. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll enjoy it. <laughs> but it makes me very happy to be alive as long as I can be alive. At the point where you have to die, then you just die and you turn yourself into dust. Um, so the, I, I cannot, you cannot say that everybody thinks that there's a no, no, heaven. There it t is a universal tendency. A, body a lot of, of yeah. exceptions. Uh, yeah. My feeling is after we die, we're going to be the same place where before we were born. Yeah. There's just nothing there. That's what I believe in. Uh, yeah. So you just enjoy Annie Hall. I just watched it again the other day. Yeah. There's that scene in Annie Hall oh. where he's ready to kill himself when he goes Allen. into a movie. Mm -hmm. and to me, Woody Allen was just as brilliant well, in that Woody scene. Allen does deal with these existential questions. He says, uh, so maybe there is life after, maybe there isn't, but why not enjoy the experience while well, we're in it? I think materialism is being aware of your physical environment. Uh, and feeling that, and a belief that beyond your physical environment, that uh, abstractions such as the soul or consciousness beyond death don't exist. Uh, when I was a kid, I OD'd on religion. And I think that since that time, I think having a lot of training in science and a lot of training, speculation about stuff like this, I think I, has changed my, certainly my attitudes when I was 20 from the time I am now. Um, I respect it. I think many of them need this to make their life meaningful. Um, some, uh, some are very rigid about this. I have a favorite saying, which I created, a closed mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> and I think that people are very rigid and closed to any new input. I think I probably do ne have negative reaction toward that. It was a very gradual evolution. Uh, <clears throat> I never perceived it as a single transformation like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, you know, that I had an epiphany. I think it's gradually the ideas of science and rationality eroded my basic beliefs in religion. We're not going to come up with any answers here today. No. But we're going to no, have a good time. No, no one has in, in thousands of years, so we're, we're not, we're not going to do and, and why are we doing this? I think it gives us a degree of pleasure. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. And I think the brain the or the mind is our, our most fun toy.